Block Party's out. Host Mike Wall, thanks for watching. If you're enjoying, please subscribe, rate, review, hit the like button, all that stuff on our YouTube channel, Process to Perform. You can find me, Mike Wall68, on Twitter, X, Process to Perform on Instagram. Our sponsor, as always, Bet Online. The tournament is here, and Bet Online is your bracket headquarters for this season with the best bracket contest out there. And odds, lines, and information on every game and every round, right up to the national championship. You can access the most up-to-the-minute wagering information anytime from your desktop or your mobile devices, and then track your bracket in real time all the way through the tournament. So head to Bet Online today and get in all the action. Remember, use your promo code Believe B L E A V for your fifty percent welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet Online. The game starts here. And uh, after a very exciting, honestly, week of, of, of free agency to start out with, the uh, the Packers are a little bit quiet here in the, uh, the last couple of weeks. They have, I think, $24 million uh, to spend. And you start looking, okay, what does $24 million buy you? And the answer is a hell of a lot, actually. But as you look at kind of the top guys out in the NFL uh, free agency market now, I'll just I just have a list of the hundred here that aren't signed yet, and let me just refresh this while I'm talking, just to make sure that I'm I'm up to date. By the way, Chase Young signs with the Saints and the Panther for Panther fans out there. I know I got some Panther fans listening. Don't be upset by that at all. Chris Kersick's the best D line coach in the world. If he couldn't get that the most out of that guy, they're not going to get the most out of him with the Saints. That's it is what it is. All right, here we go. Stephon Gilmore still out there, cornerback. Don't probably not what we're looking for. Here's the first thing: Packers don't spend a lot of money in free agency. We already spent a ton of money, right, comparatively speaking, right? I don't. There's not Charles Woodson, Reggie White sitting out there right now. Generational guys. Jadavian Clowney don't need it. Trent Brown, offensive tackle. Quite frankly, don't need it. Something we're going to address later today. Julian Blackman, safety. Ugh, maybe. Makai Becton, don't need it. Tackle for the Jets uh, probably end up going back, although they just signed Tyron Smith. That's by the way, the Jets and Aaron Rodgers. Everyone thought they were going to get back to Ari picking up Tyron Smith. If he can give you 13, 14, 15 games, good player, man. Really, really good player. Odell Beckham, don't need it. Steven Nelson, don't need it. Adore Jackson, Ryan Tan, Ryan Tannehill, Connor Williams. Interesting that he's available still. Don't think you need it. Anyways, long story short, there's some good guys, Dalton Reisner. Hmm. Be awesome to pick up Clayus Campbell. I guess the point is this. It, there's not really – you start looking at – are you going to go find a starter out there right now? The answer is probably no, unless you bring in a guy, you know, kind of a, a smaller deal guy that maybe hasn't started somewhere else. I always remember when we picked up Al Harris. He was the slot corner. This is before everybody knew that slot corners were like – really, really good players that kind of needed their own position in like all pro rankings. And we picked up Al. He was a slot corner at Philly. And he came in and we were like, because we had Chi-Town Mike McKenzie, but we were looking for a, another corner. And Al immediately was like, oh, we, Al's the guy. It, it, it was like day one of practice. Everyone's like, oh, he's he's going to start and he's going to be really, really good. Um, he's having a great coaching career right now as well. Shout out to Al. But uh there's just not a lot of positions like that anymore where I think you, you just find somebody and then you blink and all of a sudden day one, you go, oh, he's definitely the starter. Um, it, it, you actually could do that back in the day with the, with the slot corner in particular, not only because that's its own position in itself now because of all the nickel, but back in the day, that was where you, purge, you, you put your third corner and they had two they had two Pro Bowl guys over in the Eagles, but as it turns out, they really had three Pro Bowl guys and they just didn't know it yet. So what I want to talk about today, listen, we, we go in, we get rid of uh, – we release a big back and we release Aaron Jones. Jones immediately goes to the Vikings, but we replace Aaron Jones with Josh Jacobs. Um, they let some guys go on the, on the back end, but we, you know, Darnell Savage doesn't look like he's coming back. They do look like they're going to, they're going to keep um, Stokes, but we bring in Xavier McKinney um, top safety. And uh, the one thing we don't, I guess address via free agency and there's plenty of reasons for this, but we don't address the, the departure of arguably I'm just being honest. And I know everybody who's, you know, saw guys play 50, 60 years ago are going to say somebody else was like, 
In modern era football, David Bakhtiari is the best offensive lineman the Green Bay Packers have ever had. I mean, he's – you can make – you know, if you want to start talking about sitting, sitting, you know, and, and TJ, I, I like those – I mean, Bakhtiari is the left tackle, premier position. He's, he's the best lineman that they've, they've had. At, at the very least, he's the best tackle that the Packers have had in, in the history of the Green Bay Packers. Now, again, the Packers aren't – Big players historically in the free agent market when it comes to offensive linemen. One, they draft and develop really, really well historically the last 30 years. Um, good linemen aren't available in the National Football League. You look at every year now, if you a, 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 a really, really high level guy is not going to be available except for via trade. Uh, like Tyron Smith's available, but he's been hurt and he's old and, 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 and. I'm talking about prime 26 year old guy ready to go. You're just not going to, you're not going to find those guys, right? Even back when I, when I was playing, we had to put a poison pill in the contract to get released because if you have good offensive linemen, no one's going to let you go. They're just too valuable position now. And the other thing is too, if you, you, if you get the free agent market as an offensive lineman, we've seen this this year with a couple of the guard down in Miami was one of them. You're going to get $20 million plus a year. And I don't think, quite frankly, and this isn't a knock on anybody or anything, but I just don't think Matt LaFleur looks at the offensive line position, the way that he's drawn up his scheme and system. I don't think he looks at it and goes, I need to pay $20 million for a guy there. I think in his mind, he can uh, he can have very good players that are well coached, that aren't elite, 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 and have a lot of success in his program because of the way that he runs his system. Now, the other maybe there is maybe Rasheed Walker showed enough last year where the Packers are like, we don't need to waste our time. There's the draft coming up, and that could always be a possibility. But there is a very real chance that the Packers looked at the second or the final six games, let's call it, of this season and said, we don't, we got our guy. He's in the building already. We don't need to do anything about it. There's some things he can work on, but we feel really good that he's going to be our starting left tackle. They got rid of like, Yash Nyman. So we remember that he beat Yash out, and Rashid Walker beat Yash out in the beginning of the season. Then we remember that there was a little bit of a struggle. We went back and forth. We started doing the rotation thing, and then he ended up winning the spot again. And I thought he played well over the last couple games. Um, did he play well enough to, to say, this is going to be our guy? given all that we know about the position here, the way it's played, the guys that have been there historically, going back, you know, we talk about, obviously, Chad, in my generation, was elite. Chad would have been a Hall of Fame player if Chad would have given a shit about the run game, quite frankly. And I've told Chad that. He's a Hall of Fame talent. Um, Bakhtiari is a Hall of Famer. They've, they've just had dudes there that can play that position at a high, high level. And so... I don't know if Rasheed Walker is that guy, but are they are they confident in going, we had two that level player now. Are we going to bring this guy in? So I, I broke down some tape on Rasheed Walker. I know a lot of guys were asking me this question on, on all the social media platforms. Want to get a better idea of, of what we're looking at. Now, Rasheed, look, 6'6", listed at 325. He's a big dude. He doesn't look. Um, he moves well. Uh, just a quick, like, oh, my two cents before we start looking at him when you look at him from just from a physical standpoint he can put some weight on up top he can get stronger he moves extremely well for a big guy he moves extremely well for 325 um he can get tall feet aren't always underneath him ha needs better footwork uh and that sometimes doesn't allow him to maximize his kind of physical gifts his power but he is for a big man he can move very well uh, I think he can do a great job in the run and the pass game. I think he's a two-dimensional player. I like the way that he tries to finish in the run game in particular. Uh, I think at times he has a very, very good punch. He has some good he has some good technical attributes. I just think they're inconsistent at this point. As you can say about a number of players, I think he was drafted in 2022. So we're not talking – this is all recent. There's a lot of – I guess what my point is there's a lot of room to grow. Let's watch this tape. I'll, I'll kind of dig into it. Here's what I did. As you guys know, I don't try to cherry pick. So I took the first series from the last three games of the regular season. I think on one of them was a three and out. So I had to go the first, I think it was against the Vikings or something. I had to go two games or two series. Let's go into it. All right.
Okay, here we are. The first thing I'm going to point out, and this is just, listen, this is the most infuriating thing in the National Football League to me these days. And I, I honestly think, I'll say this without, some of these D-line coaches need to be fired because you can read this every time. I know exactly. I watched this tape. I watched Rasheed Walker play. And I, listen, I know I this is my job and everything, so I get it. But I watched this. It's their job too. I watched this tape. I can tell you exactly what he's doing on every single play. Maybe there's one or two plays where they might be running something trick that I, you know, who knows. But just based on his stance, if I'm a defender, I can tell you which way the play is going or at least what this tackle is going to be doing on every single play. So for, if I'm the defensive tackle, defensive end, linebacker out of the side, and I'm not reading this, we're making a huge mistake. So right away, we got outside handoff here. You just – you don't necessarily love how he gets taller because his base gets narrow, but you love how he runs off the football. I was trying to get those hands inside, driving, extending, playing extended. Love it, love it, love it. We're going to see the same thing again. Again, you notice the stance, pretty obvious. Okay, the balance and body position. Running off the ball. Now, not great footwork. Steps behind himself, second step in. You see the hands, and let's just back this up for people at home. Inside foot forward, leaned in. First step, he's this defensive uh, defensive end is going two hands, left foot, two hands down, trying to catch you. Okay, so can't be surprised by this. We got we get kind of extended by the defensive end. Not a great footwork, but does a good job of getting his hips to it and creating pressure. Obviously, this defensive end is going this defensive end is going to feel pretty good about the way he set this up. But the fight is there. Now, toes out. Body position is pointed towards the defensive tackle. In other words, he's leaning into this a little bit. And he's going to run the hinge. Love the way he finishes this. So he's coming down to help the center. You really want to leave your outside hand engaged here and and. And Myers has to come over and, and get all of this because of that defensive end. We'll show it a little bit later. If they chase, you got to be able to open up and make and, and get on the chaser, the defensive end. Now, the defensive end plays over the top. So, what does Rashid Walker do? A great job at just driving and trying to create some more space and finishing the block. So, I absolutely love that. I, I, you can't see enough of it. Um, you're not going to get that from the high, high level guys more often than not, quite frankly, they think they're too good for it. So you like the youth right here and just being able to move around. So big fan of that. Now, this stance, regardless if he's in two or three point, this is a pass set. Okay. Every time he's got his foot out, kicked out to the point into the sideline. I don't know why coaches teach this it's terrible mechanics, but it is what it is. We know he's going back. I think you might end up getting a looper here. But again, you can read that pretty easily if you're playing defense. Now let's get into some more stuff. You don't like the hand placement. You don't like that he gets narrow, but you love the way this guy tries to drive with his hips. So we could work on a couple different things here, right? Particularly, you want to get a little bit lower. We call it gut dropping but you really want to get your hands inside here to give yourself a little bit better chance of success. Having said that, because he really just keeps driving and driving and working and working and working, listen, there's not a lot of elite-level defensive tackles in the National Football League, okay? So a guy, some guys might make you pay. Aaron Donald makes you pay immediately for doing this. Whoever's playing for the Carolina Panthers, I don't even know who this is. I don't think this is Derek Brown. Derek's not making – this isn't Derek Brown. I shouldn't say that. I know it's not. He's not making him pay. He ends up dump trucking him. Love the effort. Love the way he's trying to finish. Pass pro. A little bit tall. It's okay. Now, this is the one I think we got to really just continue to build as far as you're down on the goal line. You know you're one-on-one. -on -one. You're kind of worried, is this guy going to slant, spike? He's going to jump outside. Better footwork here. Stay balanced. Okay, so he gets he doesn't really go anywhere with the second, 
right? So he gets in kind of a stalemate position just by design, almost by the way that he blocks this instead of trying to gain ground with that second step, strike and drive through, roll your hips through. Doesn't really do a good job of staying balanced. Hands are outside, ends up getting tossed, right? Right in the hole. And I think Aaron Jones ends up running through this and making a play. But again, listen, this is all stuff you can you can improve on. Um, and this, you know, everything we've shown so far, aside from the stance, stance stuff, which is honestly a really easy fix. It's just they're not paying attention to it. Um, everything's footwork. And it's not, it's not feet. He's got good feet. He needs better footwork. Okay, huge difference. Just coaching. Okay, we got pass pro loops back in. No big deal. Now, everybody at home, just try to guess what he's doing right now. Okay, so this is what we talked about. You can see he's kind of leaning in. And he's going to hinge it and settle back out. But he goes two hands in here. And so now he can't get back. So just a little technique thing, but now you're giving the defensive end an idea that maybe he can get, he can chase down that guard and get in the path of the running back here. So that he ends up getting in on the play. Obviously, he doesn't get on the play if the play works perfect, but it's no excuse not to just leave that outside hand free so you can really ward that off. Again, 99% of the people out there are going to see that play because it's not a pass pro and he's he's the left tackle. I look at everything because everything matters to me. Good job kicking through this and just setting on that outside pressure look. You'll see with um, Rashid, especially towards the end of the year, he's really trying to get deep and try to stay square. He doesn't always get there, but he's trying to stay as square as possible. Here's another one. Now, how big of a deal is it that we got a little bit of a chip here? Because really, Rashid Walker steps underneath himself. That's a terrible kick. And you see he's opened up early. It's a terrible, terrible technique. But he's able to, and it probably promotes it a little bit because they can use that tight end to chip out. And again, when I talk about you know maybe not thinking that they need to spend a first-round pick or they need to do this or that for a tackle, you know, a lot of stuff that Matt does in his offense is using these tight ends to, to bump out on both sides. You see it actually here. They're bumping out both sides, um, especially in away games. They'll use the back to chip out. So they do a bunch of different stuff, and obviously the moving the ball and, and three steps and all this. They do a bunch of different stuff to put these tackles in a position to be successful more often than not. So with that, and I can tell you for this firsthand, when you have that help, you almost feel like you don't need to use your technique. You just need to get back to a spot and just kind of play basketball. But the reality is that everything kind of matters and it sets you up for success and maybe different reps. We let him get a little bit close. Guy tries to spin, gets inside, gets banged around. Again, we know this is, if you look at this stance, looks a little bit different than the last one. And again, footwork. Okay. He's leaning in. So you, if you've watched, you know, four of these, you can figure out where he's going. Now you got to gain ground and gain leverage on this first step. He steps underneath himself. So he puts Elgin really in a bad position here to get where he needs to get because he's not covering up and he can't make that play. And this is just a footwork thing. So the cool thing is about like all this stuff is if you think you're a good developer of talent, like if you think you're a really good coach, then all you need to look at about Rashid Walker, honestly, I could read on a scouting report. I mean, truthfully. Now, I'm talking about if you're thinking about bringing him in or not. The, you, you watch it and you go, okay, he's 6'6", he's 324, he runs this. He, uh, we think that he's you know, strong enough. We think that he's fast enough. And then you have it, you, you talk to him, you see what kind of guy he is. You talk to his coach, you see what kind of person he is. But you can just watch him kind of move around. Like, I don't really care. Like, when I see this, I don't really care because I go, oh, I can, no problem. Like we could fix that in an off season. This guy will have uh, his footwork will be, you know, a hundred percent better. So you don't really care. But if you're not that kind of program, or if you're not that kind of coach, if you don't have that, then this stuff is a red flag because there are going to be plays in games where you go, you know what, you got to take better footwork, or it's not going to happen. And we're not teaching you to take better footwork. So we got pass pro here. Love this extension. 
Okay, it's just top tier. So he does this enough where he gets he punches and gets extended where you go, okay, he can definitely do this. Like this part of the game, he can do. He gets himself back. He gets himself into a good body position, and he gets punched and extended. So you're buying that space and that time for that second move for that defensive end. Remember, defensive ends want to attack your elbows, want to attack your armpits, want to smell your breath before they make a move. We want to keep them extended. Go here. Again, we can take a probably a pretty good guess at what at, at, at the fact that it's pro. Now, when you get punched like this, you got to keep your feet in the ground. So when you have that contact, there's two things that are happening here. He gets kind of caught on the stutter bull. His, his, his right foot's in the air, but he doesn't ever really get a punch in. So this is just stuff, again, where constant work on your craft. Again, very, very coachable. And it's not even that he's not being coached. This is just a rep thing over time. Some people get this real early. Some people have a great you know, college coach. You have, some people have a great high school coach. If you don't and you get to the league and you're like this, well, you can just work on it. That's it. The more, the more powerful he is up top, by the way, the easier it's going to be for him to sit down a lot of these, these bulls. People that say bench press is important, shoulder press is important. You're out of your minds. You're absolutely out of your minds. It does matter. Now, what you'd just love to see from a stance, doesn't it – And when you just look at Zach Tom and then you look at Rashid, who do you think looks more explosive, knowing that this is pass protection? Like, who do you think, if you were going to say, I bet you one of these guys can just explode out of that stance and stay in a great body position more. I just, it, Zach looks like he's more loaded up and ready to go. Now, I think Rashid does a good job here, no question. But because of the way that he's moving and getting those feet clicked together and everything, not really able to attack back with Elgin, and this happens fast, to be fair. And this is why they, the Vikings run it how they do. But it's hard for Jenkins to really get off like he wants to here. He ends up getting off late, and luckily the ball's out. But you'd just like to see all the transitions as fast as possible. So now we're going to have, it looks like he's, squ he's squared up. So it's like we're going to have like some sort of run, play side run. He's probably run, running. Looks like he's going to run against the four technique here. Yeah, so we got – he's a little late off the ball, but you see how the, the the steps just kind of replace themselves laterally instead of gaining ground second and really trying to drive your foot in. And then he actually takes a backward step on his third because he's been shocked a little bit. But you want to go forward on your second, really recreate the line of scrimmage, especially we have inside help. I always tell my tackles, you get paid to pass pro, you get famous by knocking the shit out of somebody – when you got a, this double team like this. So if you have inside help and you can tee off on someone, this is where you knock a guy three yards off the ball. Every once in a while you get a pancake block, right? You have those backside Bs. When you have help and you can tee off, you got to use it. When you're the horsepower and you can really move somebody, this is where you get your, make a name for yourself. Got pass pro. Good extension, really. His hands kind of save him here. You don't love how tall he gets in that in that set. Like to be a little calmer. Okay, now we're back again with the play side run. Now, great result here. Okay, great result. But you see him giving up ground and whatnot. Now this happens a lot in football, and and you know ideally with these as players, and I, I everybody fell, falls into this trap. You just want to get out there and wheel. Now, all the bad things that can happen as far as the penetration and then when every time you turn your shoulders without having your hip across um, the play side hip of the defensive end, defensive tackle here, they can always play you over the top. So sometimes this works when the guy just buries his head and tries to bull rush you. But a lot of times this ends up poorly because you're crossing over, you're high, you're catching, you're, you're, pen you're giving up penetration. And if the guy wanted to go outside, anytime you try to shut the door and you don't have your hip in front of his hip or up upfield from his hip, you have problems. Now, having said all that, results matter, and this he does a he does a good job here. The tight end certainly helps. He ends up getting the cutoff. Huge play in the game. You see the stance, you see the body language. He's leaning forward. He's obviously going to go out and try to block this this five tech. Yeah, second step strike here. 
really want to come down and pop and rise and think think vertical, vertical, vertical because you're running up to this backer. Great job here. Now you can't you can't uh, fault anyone for doing their job. And AJ goes backside. This is because Myers got beat. But they do a good job here getting the second step. He, he does a good job, Rashid Walker, of getting step, second step at the ground and using that power. He is an explosive player. Look, you don't you don't weigh 325 and move like he does if you're not explosive. So it's just a question of putting it all together on a consistent basis. Got pass pro again here. And he does such a good job of dropping that shoulder in, right? It shuts the door on this turn. I love when tackles do this. Instead of letting the guy kind of loop back outside and shut the door right there because you don't know what that end's going to do and it gives your quarterback room to escape because you can stop penetration and stop progress right now by slamming the door shut. I love what he does here. Low to high really takes out that Minnesota Vikings defensive tackle trying to run the TE game here. So even if Jenkins can't come back, you see Jenkins is a little bit of bad position. He got his arm beat here. Doesn't matter. Jordan Love can... Come back out and release. So excellent job by, by Rashid there. Now we go to the last game versus the Bears. This is a screen. So he's giving up the bull on purpose. Big deal here. Tight end is in. Gives him a little block. Changes the trajectory of the, of the defensive end. Right? Just that body presence changes the way that that defensive end rushes right and even if the tight ends in other words you know this is the thing about traditional right-handed offenses with the left tackle back in the day is you never had the tight end on your side it was always on the right tackle side and so it, it changes the the trajectory of the end because the end doesn't want to hit the tight end on the way out because it's going to ruin his pass rush but that does mean he has to go higher and he has to be a little bit wider and just from a timing standpoint, it makes it easier on the tackle. Good job, body position, hands. You see the TE game here because he sees that wide three technique. is really like a four technique. Has the vision here to play this back, drive on it. Can't see the whole whole clip, but he drives back on the on the defensive tackle. Great job. Now you see a little bit of a different stance here. Loses ground on that first step. Now, he's such a good athlete, and quite frankly, 93 doesn't make him pay here. He's such a good athlete that he gets his head play side. Now, this is what we're always talking about. Don't turn, just run on your track. When you turn, you can get, he turns right there. You see it, now 93 can beat him over the top. You just run, you get him downfield, he'll, he'll never get over the top of you, right? Unless you're 10 yards downfield. So just stay on your track again. It's a youth thing. It's a coaching thing. Definitely can overcome it. You see the foot kicked out. You have a pretty good idea what's going on here. Now, these are the situations that I think historically, when you talk about Rashid Walker, are some of the areas of opportunity, right? Don't get your feet wide. Be a little bit more square to the line of scrimmage. Sit down. Get those hips down. Don't get thrown around like that. Walker's a strong guy, but, you know, you want to be able to sit down a little bit. Love this. Love this. Can't get enough of this. Now, we've seen this on tape multiple times from Rashid Walker where he is trying to finish blocks in the run game. Can't say enough about what this does for the entire offense when, when you got a guy playing like that. I absolutely love it. Can't say enough good things about it. Okay. Back in pro. Gets the stab. Gets the arm down right here. Fantastic job. Now, this is against Sweat who they brought in and was really uh, lighter fluid for their, their defense, quite frankly. Does a good job with the hands, so you can see the calmness, okay? It takes a calm guy to attack that elbow right there, get back down. He's got a little hinge here, don't care about. Again, it's, it's one of those things where you're never, you're never right, you're never wrong, right? You're supposed to sift up. Great communication here by Elgin Jenkins. You actually see him talking to Rashid. To Rashid. So Elgin's going to step down. He knows this guy because of the square stance is going to loop out. So Elgin does a great job communicating there. 
comes through, ends up making the play. Now, we don't get play side. We don't get the backer, but Elgin, Elgin does a really nice job here. She does a good job of hearing it, taking the right footwork to get the cutoff, sealing that shut, creating a lane. Fantastic job all around. Good job using the tight end to slow the momentum and then gloving up sweat there. Now, we showed it already once. Just the presence there helps, but you got to be consistent. So you see 95 here doesn't even have a good get off. Right? But now he's too close. Okay. You're not extended. Your hands are going to be outside. You're not in position power. You're not going to engage your hips when you punch. Okay. So you just get walked right here. And this is the one he's got to learn how to fix. He's more than capable of fixing it. Absolutely. But that's where the that's kind of where the question marks happen, right? Can can we can we look at that tape? And they, of course, are going to scour every tape. But you know, I, I'll be honest with you guys. You know everything you need to know right there in three series. You know, when they made that movie Training Day, and the guys, like, I watched every clip and everything. You know, they talk about the years. I watched every clip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, but guys are guys are the same, right? It doesn't matter. It, guys are the same. They move the same. They have the same behaviors. Now, if they improve from like week one to week seven to week 14, now that's something different maybe. But if you look at guys, you know, a couple of series and a guy the last three weeks of the season and he's doing certain things, that's who he is. Now, you could change it, but if, you know, let's say he has, you know, a guy has a bad rep every once in a while or a guy has a good rep every once in a while, you, you just look for what are the what are the overarching features. We kind of showed it. Uh, with Rashid right there. You know, you talk about his stance, talk about his first step, talk about his hand. Like, he shows he can do it. He shows he can be coached to do it. He also shows he's not consistent at it. So so what does that tell you? Um, it tells me he has a lot. He's got room to grow physically. As as big as he is, he's got room to grow physically, I think, up top especially. Um, so maybe some mobility work. He has good feet. He can improve. He's an explosive player but he doesn't put himself in body positions to be explosive all the time. So he can definitely improve that. A lot of technical work. I think the bottom line is this for me, Rashid Walker has room to grow and to improve. He's a, going into, I think year three this year. I don't know. I'm not going to condemn anybody. I don't know if he's as good as Chad. He's not right out the gate as good as Chad. I don't know if he's, I don't know if he'll ever be as good as, as, as Bach. Uh, Tiari was. I don't think that's fair to put that on anybody. But within the Matt LaFleur system and the way that they run, I think Matt would value a slot receiver or another tight end or another running somebody. I think he would value another position in the draft potentially more than picking a high guy at tackle. Just looking at without the, what, what's out there right now with the tackle draft. Then and then and leaving Rashid Walker in there. I think he's I just think year three taking another step, you just can see that yeah, he's not he's not back to Yari. But that's not not a lot of people are back to Yari. But if I sit here and just honestly look at let's just look at the top pick 25, okay? Joe Alt's off the board. Latham is probably off the board. Latham's a really interesting guy, by the way, the, the kid from uh, Alabama. I mean, 342, he played right. I think he played right tackle for most of the time, but 6'6", 340, run a 485. Uh, Fuaga's going to be a right tackle you don't need. Now, the kid from Washington, for me, are out of the box, I really, really like him. I really like him. But the problem is he can play guard, or tackle, and if he struggles at one initially, are you going to move him to the other? Well, let me rephrase that. He's not going to struggle at guard. If he struggles at tackle, are you going to move him to guard? Because a lot of guys have him number one, I'm sure, at guard, because he's good. He might be there, but with that kind of guy there, I mean, Alt's going to be off the board. Fashanu, I think people are, my personal opinion, uh, the kid from Penn State, Rashid Walker's from Penn State, by the way, so that, that could be a connection. I don't know that I like Fashanu better than like Rashid Walker. I see why people could. I mean, athletically, I think he's he's pretty talented. 
But just like this year, year three for Rasheed Walker versus year one of that guy, I'm not, I'm not taking that, I'm not taking that pick. Like there's nobody out here where I'm just like, this is a complete shutdown, dude. A lot of people are talking about Graham, Graham Barton. I don't know if Graham Barton's gonna be a tackle. We looked at Jordan Morgan. Jordan Morgan's not gonna outplay him year one. No way. So I don't know where you I, I don't know where you go, I guess. That is going to be right now, you know, they didn't pick anybody up at free agency. I don't know that you go anywhere and just look aside from maybe the top Joe Alt, maybe the kid from Washington, maybe the kid from Bama if he's there. I think there's a kid from Georgia that I liked. Uh, Mims. <sighs> just another monster. Not really what we're traditionally getting here. He's over 340 pounds. All the guys are going to need work. So you already drafted this guy. You already like him. Why not just use him? Bring in some competition, but maybe it's not a first-round pick competition. I mean, that's that's how I see it. All right, we got some listener questions, and I, there's a couple I really wanted to address because uh, I think there's some interesting stuff here. All right. Oh, number one, is it somebody asked me this? Was Mike Sherman good for the locker room and did he get a raw deal by Ted? Uh Mike Sherman's the best coach I ever had. The best pro coach I ever had, I should say. My best coach ever was Todd. My best coach was my father, Todd Spencer, Naval uh, Naval Academy. What a what a human. Uh and and Coach B and all those guys. Mike Sherman was a great head coach for me. Uh very, very analytical. I know I wasn't his favorite guy. But very, very analytical, uh, very smart, um, new offensive line play inside. And I was an offensive line coach. So, like, was not going to put us in a bad situation. Um, just had a high demand for excellence. The thing that hurt Mike, and I, I'm, Mike would agree, is I think being a general manager at the same time being a head coach is hard because as you're walking down the hall with Mike, Mike's not a, hey, let's chop it up guy. And so if you're a defensive player and your defense is not doing well and you're walking down the hall and you see Mike, are you seeing Mike the coach? Are you seeing Mike the general manager? And I think that was hard for guys. And I don't think it's something that Mike was doing. I just think it's it, in nature of the beast. It was hard. Now, when Ted came in and they took the GM away job, GM job away, and then they went four and 12. So he gets fired. I think he knew he was getting fired when, when Ted got hired. I think if you, if you look back at it, my guess is, Look, they just stripped me of this position. Holmgren wanted it forever. He had to leave to get it. They stripped me of the position of general manager. They bring in a guy that, while I know him, he's in a different position now where there's different power. Like the 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 power struggle is, or dynamics are far different than they used to be. So, but yeah, the short the short answer is, I thought he was a I thought he was a really really good coach, really good coach. Uh, number two. Who is closer to making the leap to becoming a dual threat defensive tackle like uh, Kenny Clark this year? Uh, I think they were talking about. Uh, I think they were talking about about Carl Brooks or uh, or or Wyatt. And I first had to go. I in my mind, this is so stupid to me, but I go, is Case is Kenny a dual threat guy? And then I go, oh, he had seven and a half sacks last year. He definitely is a dual threat guy. What are you thinking? Um, uh, listen, I like Carl Brooks's game better now than Wyatt's. I think Wyatt's probably a better at. I'm sure there's like physical attributes you could talk about. But Carl Brooks is one of those guys that just kind of figures out where the ball is really easily. And and it's almost like it's I don't know if you can teach it. And I think he I so I think he has that that quality that you don't always teach. He's just one of those like he's one of those guys who just kind of finds his, his nose is around the football all the time. I think he's very fluid in his pass rush. Um I think Devontae's got a lot of things that he improved not particularly in pad level in the run game from year one to year two. And I think he's going to continue to be that guy. Um, so he's probably going to be the longer term starter there. I just think physically that's probably a realistic comment, but I, I really like what, what, uh, what Carl Brooks can do, uh, particularly in the past game. He just has a very natural nose for the football. Lewis Riddick opened up uh, this narrative about, you're talking about, I don't know if he was talking about quarterbacks and developing and this and that and all the other things. There's just all of these things going on. I, I try not to listen to too much of it, but I think Lewis Riddick is a really, really good at his job. And I think he's very thoughtful. And I don't I think that he makes comments that are that are based on experience, 
uh, firsthand experience from him in multiple facets of the of this game, player, personnel guy. And I think that he doesn't th- say things to get clicks. I think he's he thinks he says he's saying things to educate people, to make people's lives more enriched, not to get clicks like some of these other people out there. So he talked about quality, the the lack of actual quality coaching staffs in the league, and how going to a specific place is a long is a is a potential long term indicator of success for that player. And we talk about it here all the time. For ninety five percent of the players in the national football league where you get drafted is going to make or break your career. You get drafted to the Arizona Cardinals. Uh, historically, you're, you're not going to do very well unless you're a top, top, top guy. Cause they don't have a good development program. They don't have good staff. They don't have, you know, there's so many things you get to, you get brought into one of the, the top eight franchises in the national football league that have their stuff figured out from a culture standpoint. They have a development programs. You know, they have guys that want to develop. They have mentors. Let's just talk about the things that go into a good program. Okay. And, and here's where you see this really play out. Well, it's, it's kind of obvious. When you get towards the end of the draft, guys start hoping that they go undrafted instead of getting drafted in like this, with the last round because they know they can choose where they go. And the money doesn't, you know, $5,000, $10,000, they might get a signing bonus, they might not. It might be slotted in for the sixth, seventh round, it might not. But if you get to choose where you're going and you know that that place is invested in you becoming a player, that's a lot different than a, somebody taking a flyer on you in the last round. And so you see guys continuing to go to specific places because of the history that they have at that place for development. Where you get drafted has more impact on your career for 95% of the guys than any other external factor going. Now, there's all the internal stuff of why you're going to get drafted and how you're going to do, right? Resiliency, professionalism, you know, stick to itness, whatever, you know, the short term pain, long term gain, all the stuff we talk about. But now externally, organizational support, the quality of the coaching staff, the continuity of the coaching staff, right? The changes that they're making have a from year to year have a huge impact. If you're a quarterback and you got four coordinators in four years, if you're an offensive lineman, you got four offensive line coaches in four years, you're gonna have problems developing. Baker Mayfield, easy. Such an easy thing to point to. Here's something you don't always hear about is Green Bay Packers. When I get there, locker room culture, two-time Super Bowl appearance. Leroy Butler, Brett, Chewy, Frank, Reggie, Santana, Gilbert, Nardo, dudes, right? Guys, Dorsey. They every you know, Zimmerman. There's got everybody, the culture. The expectations, the lack of fear in passing along information to younger players. In other words, I'm good enough. I'm not worried about telling you what I'm doing because I don't think you can do it better than me. Okay? Not every place has that. The desire to develop and the timeline to develop. So I've been in, I've been on the other side of this where you get in, they talk about developing guys, and got really the truth is they talk about it in the offseason. You know, maybe they got somebody who's ahead of, you know, we're heading this, this, this program to, you know, race to race to maturity, but then you get into the season. All they care about is, Hey, we got to win this next game. And they stop thinking about how are we going to develop our third guy? How are we going to develop our, our third round pick into a starter next year? They stop thinking about it because all they're worried about is getting fired. So they got to win that next game. All that's. And then if they make it through that year, what can I do in the off season to make it look like I deserve to be here for it? it the, the plan changes. You think about the perspective of time from a player who's got, if they're lucky, seven to 10 years, if they're lucky, seven to 10 years of being a professional athlete versus uh, a player, or excuse me, versus a coach, personnel guy, and an agent. Those guys are thinking 50-year careers, different teams, different players. Guy comes in, train him up. He does a good job. Maybe you pay him, and but he does a good job. You stick around, Okay. If you're like position coach, coordinator, you pay him, he leaves, you got to do another one. But you're going to do that for, you know, 10 times, 20 times. You coach him up, you lose games, you feel like you deserve to, you deserve better because you coached him up. You're fired. Now you got to go somewhere else. After a while, what, what matters to you? You got into the game to develop talent. Now you're just trying to win. Naturally. Because winning is what matters. 
So you forget this other stuff, how important it is. Because maybe you don't think you have time to develop these guys. The player's looking at it like, I only got so much time. I got time to waste. If I waste two years, I waste 20% of my career because you didn't want to coach me. You got problems. Agent, cycle through players, right? What are they always trying to do? Get more players, get more players, get more players. Now they can treat their players well, but the truth is they're always trying to get more players. Why? Because they know you're going to retire soon. They got to get another guy. They got relationships with teams. Hey, you can go over here. Go play for this guy. I know I have this coach. Go play for this coach. I know he's good. Or I'm, I'm, they're friends with the, with, the, with the president, with the general manager, right? We'll get him in. The perspective, it's a business, and there's nothing wrong with it. what anybody's doing. You just have to understand there is a difference. I always look at Evan Mathis. Evan Mathis was an Alabama guard tackle that came in my first year in Carolina. Drafted, I think, second or maybe second round. Freak athlete. Freak athlete. I've had him on the show. He's a journeyman for like five years. Didn't develop in Carolina. Bounced around a couple different places. He ends up in the Eagles with Mud, uh, Coach Mud. Finally gets that guy that says the right thing, puts him in the right position to be successful. Multiple, multiple year all pro, arguably the best guard in football for a couple of years. Big contracts, notoriety, all everything you ever wanted. Unsuccessful largely for the first five years of his career or nondescript. Freak athlete, has everything, needs that place, right? Finds the right staff, finds the right coach, finds the right situation. It matters. And he's, he's a better athlete than 99% of the people at his position. So I think that is such an interesting talking point for, I don't know how interesting it is for fans, quite frankly, but, but when you look at your team and when your team is not doing well, when your team has consistently has the same problems, when your franchise can't get out of its own way, you know, you go, okay, where is the pro The problem has got to start probably at the top with the communication from the, the owner, the president. But then when you're going down from a leadership, you know, is it, or do we have, do we have the head coach's way of doing business? Is it the general manager's way of doing business? Who's in charge? Who's developing the culture? Who's, whose job is it to choose the players? Is it a collaboration? Is it one versus the other? Are they, in, are they, are they in, uh, are they, uh, was that a typical with, no, that's the wrong word. Are, are they are in accord with one another or are they are constantly the general manager telling you this is the kind of player I want. You have to develop them. Where's the onus go if the players aren't playing well? All of that stuff has to be figured out. Are you together or is everybody fighting for their own job? Like that happens in a ton of these places and that's why you don't have success. Now the Packers have been lucky for the most part. They, you know, they have 10 year long, you know, these head coaches have pretty decent tenures, five years plus. That's because actually, you know, quite frankly, not having an owner makes it a lot easier. It makes it a ton easier than having some of these guys that, you know, made a ton of money doing something else because they're really smart, but they not might not be good at this because this is a hobby that pays well. It's different. All right, enough of that. The last one I want to hit is this Devondre Campbell comment. Okay, they came out this year, uh, this week, and I, I'm just going to tell you flat up before I start. I probably don't know every comment that was made, but the ones that I have right here, I 100 believe, I percent, 100 percent believe every single, every single thing he said. So I'm going to quote these these things. I'll, I'll give you my my thoughts. Quote: Listen, if I would have listened to half the stuff they were telling me, I would have never went all pro. All year, all I heard was. Can you do this? It'll help the scheme. And I kept saying no all year. And look what happened. First team all pro. Fast forward to the 2022 and 2023 seasons when he got paid. Okay. So now you got paid. I'm just now my commentary got paid team player. Right. I tried to be a team guy and play within the system and do what they asked. Quote, be more visual, visual on the quarterback and not look up routes. End quote with what, what, what they're telling him. Back up from the line of scrimmage so I'm not pressing every wide receiver or tight end. Look what happened. They had me and Quay looking clueless. So much hate. You want to know why we played better? Because I started going and having private meetings with Matt LaFleur and telling him we needed to be more aggressive. We needed more man and we needed to blitz more. And what happened when they listened to me? We played well and won. It's no coincidence. 
There's not a, a single thing in there. You can like it. You don't. You can like that he's. Air, you cannot like that he's airing dirty laundry. He obviously felt like he got done wrong. I think there was another quote in there somewhere saying that he was told he's to be part of the program and then he wasn't. Uh, I know that his play was not as good as it was in that that All Pro year. I know that he never played All Pro before that year. I know that he was injured the next the year after. I know he got paid. I know there's a lot of things to point to and say, well, maybe he's just not that guy. And I'll say this, AG and I tried to get him on uh, the show after his All-Pro year, and his representation called and told us that we'd have to pay him thousands and thousands of dollars to show up on our show, and we laughed at him. So you have some thoughts about the way maybe we're doing some of this stuff, but right here? Every bit of that makes sense to me, right? He's been in Atlanta. Things aren't going well. He thinks he's a better player than, than what's showing up on tape. They come here. They're asking him to do a bunch of stuff. He's, he, he's, he becomes a little bit selfish. He plays extremely well. Goes all pro. They give him. They pay him. And what happens when you get paid? Hey man, you got to play by. You got to help us out now. Be our guy. Be a team guy. What happens? Your performance goes down. Your performance goes down after a year or two. You get injured. Okay, people are not saying the same things about you in the media. You're not looked at the same way. You go to coach. Hey, listen, I'm t- like these players are not stupid. They know these players watch so much tape. They have a different perspective in the game than coaches. He goes to the head coach and says, "We're not doing this. We're not doing that." They start doing it. They start playing better. Now, is it all because he said something? No. Okay, are we going to put all the blame on him or all the credit? No. But does what he said make 100% sense to me? Absolutely. All of that makes sense. And it just goes to show you, I think, that a lot of the concerns that you you know, you know voice when things aren't going well in Green Bay, you know, you're not that far away from some of these other programs. You just happen to have, for years and years, you have, you know, Hall of Fame quarterbacks. You have... Um, now you've got looks like you you've got a, a head coach that from a play calling standpoint is completely in line with his quarterback and his wide his young wide receiver group. Um uh, and you've got, well, at the time, I think eight first round draft picks on defense that, you know, are arguably trying to play to their potential or not playing to whatever it is. And, you know, they've made some adjustments on that side because of it. But none of this stuff, you would be shocked and amazed if you took an honest quote poll from guys at different places, how much of this stuff resonates. And I I can't tell you, I've heard the same thing dozens of times from dozens of defensive players on tons of different teams, both where I played, where I coached, where I consulted, where guys I work with. This happens all the time. And it doesn't make the coaches wrong, okay? But it is interesting to see where valued players are and are not listened to or – we don't make the adjustments to in the best interest of our players. Sometimes we do what's best in the best interest of or most comfortable for the coaches because ultimately they have to call the game and all that stuff. And where do you make those concessions? You know, if Reggie White goes in there and says, I'm not doing this, maybe the life's different, but he's not Reggie, so where does that fall? I just think it's a, a really, really interesting – Look, I think organizational culture is the most interesting thing you can watch with these teams, right? Just like in business. And when you're trying to pick a winner in business, you're trying to pick a stock uh, to, to buy into or invest in. When you're when you're trying to uh, when you're trying to pick a company that you want to you want to devote time or, or resources into. When you look at this, you want to devote your attention to as a as a player, as a coach, as an organizational member, as a fan. All of this stuff is so interesting to me. How they operate, and you take so much. Um, for all the problems that every culture or every um, every company has, every organization has. Listen, nobody's perfect. Everybody's got bad apples. Everybody's got problems and issues they deal with. Everybody's got situations like these where there's a player who's disgruntled and speaks out. Everyone's got a player, a situation like this where a player leaves and says, all oh, these things could have happened. I'm saying that this is probably true. There's a lot of stuff that probably isn't or embellished. There's a lot of this that makes a lot of sense. And what do you take away from that? It's probably good that they moved on from that defensive staff. That's the big takeaway. So, guys, thanks, as always, for bringing in your questions, particularly uh, those last two. You know, it's always um, – I don't know. Look at what this show, as you've probably guessed, I'm pretty much talking about the stuff that I find interesting, 
and hope that you find it interesting as well. So that's why I try to get some some uh, some questions from from uh, the listeners as much as I can, because uh, I might as well be on a different planet sometimes. The things that go through my head. But thank you as always for watching. Thanks to uh, the uh, Battle Online for our sponsorship. Find me at Michael 68 on Twitter, Process to Perform X, Process to Perform on Instagram. And as always, hit that subscribe button, like us, share us, all that stuff. Thank you guys.